once again, and I am uh, battling with my voice, so if I don't yell too much tonight, you won't hold it against me, I hope. Okay, you will. So I'll work on that. How, how many of you are cold? You guys are weird. <laughs> Back home, unless it is, well, it'd be 50 degrees my weather, so it'd be 10 degrees Celsius your weather. I don't put a jacket on until I get to at least to that, and most of the time, less. You guys think I'm crazy, don't you? You guys are nuts. This is great weather, and it is nice and cool, and... You guys got sweaters on like you're freezing to death. <laughs> Something wrong with you guys. Psalms chapter 27, if you take your Bibles there this evening. While you're turning there, why don't you get everybody stood up, and then I'd like you to turn to the person next to you, and I'd like you to shake their hand. All right? All right, let me try this again. I know we're talking to ministry people, but you can do what I'm, I'm, I'm asking you. Turn to the person next to you shake their hand and say this I'm so glad that I don't look like you <laughs> David said that we are fearfully and wonderfully made some if I you, wanted to look like the lady next to me, I'd wear a pink shirt, well, like some of these guys do. Yeah, well, <laughs> David said we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Some of you more fearfully than others. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, it's all right to uh, smile and laugh and enjoy yourself in the house of God. Amen. One thing I love about my church back home is we... We are, it's all business. We believe the church is a business as far as getting the job, the work of the Lord done and staying focused upon that. But we like to have a good time too. And the Bible says uh, uh, that laughter doeth good as a me like a medicine. That's reading right, some of you are sick all the time because you don't laugh. There's a lot of things funny, aren't there? Amen. Just don't laugh at each other, all right, at their expense, all right? Jed said I was fat a while ago. That wasn't very funny, all right? But no, he didn't say that. He was talking about something else. But tonight I want to try to preach to you a message that is uh, a little uh, more, um, less serious and not yelling at you about not quitting. And I want to really try to fo turn the focus around and put it on the reason that you shouldn't quit. And that is because God loves us. And God is always faithful. What a great song, amen, over and over. One of the most favorite songs I have is that song right there, ladies. You guys sing that again if you want to, uh, tomorrow or whatever. Over and over and over and over again, God is, that song has been true in my life several times. That God has come to say, you know what? Things may be falling apart but I got everything under control. Amen. Amen. And Psalms chapter 27 is that particular Psalms and uh, David here is uh, going through some troublesome times, but he makes a statement at the end of the chapter that you and I need to really take hold on this evening, but I really need to read the whole chapter because it really prepares you for uh, the last statement that he makes. And that in verse number one, it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear, though war should rise against me, in this Will I be confident? One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. 
And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou said, Seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face from far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Amen. Teach me the way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight and we are a people that are in great need of you helping us, you intervening, you protecting us, guiding us. And all of that is dependent upon us waiting on you, being patient and just allowing you to do work that only you can do and Sometimes, Father, we get in the way and we, we try to make our own path. We try to solve our own problems. But all you really need us to do is just step back and take a moment. As David said in Psalms 46, 10, be still and know that I am God. God, help us tonight to take a few moments and help us to wait upon you. I know that there are some here this evening that have some very heavy burdens on their heart about their ministries, maybe about their marriages, about their home life and their children. I beg you tonight to lighten their load and give them the patience they need to just wait upon you. For if we will, you'll always be faithful. And you'll always come through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Okay. Because I'm preaching to ministry people tonight, I want you to realize a few things that the realities of ministry life are not what some want us to talk about. For instance, ministry life can be extremely difficult. It can be hard. I'm not a complainer by nature. In fact, to be honest with you, I despise being around people that are complainers. I, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be down in the dumps all the time. I don't want to be drugged down there. And so I just don't hang around people that are down in the mouth are disgruntled about the things of, of God or the, the ministries, so to speak. But the reality is this, the ministry life can be difficult. Ministry life can be unpredictable. You never know what's going to happen from one day to the next, from one morning to the, to the next morning, from one Sunday to the next Sunday. So many things transpire in our lives and it, it becomes a point where sometimes you get up you and you say things like this, well, I wonder what's going to happen today. Yeah. Sometimes when you're going through some very difficult times of life, you wonder what can I handle next and what can be thrown upon me and how much harder can this possibly be because it's so unpredictable. The ministry life can be lonely. And if you're a pastor this evening, you understand that probably more than most. Because we don't have the right nor the option to lay upon our people 
the burdens that we carry, the discouragements that we fight, and the depressions at times that we will uh, be faced with, and the struggles that are there because they are not there to carry our load. We are there to carry theirs. And so sometimes we find ourselves in a very lonely state and no one really to talk to and to confide in. And it can be very, very troubling to us. The ministry life as well, very honestly, can be extremely sorrowful. Sometimes we experience great loss. And sometimes that loss comes right in the middle of somebody else's loss. And we have to take our loss and set it over here and, and put it to the side so that we can lift the burdens and the sorrows of somebody else. And then we go back and we deal with ours. And sometimes people wonder, well, what's going on with the pastor? Why, is he, why does he look like that he's uh, down in the dumps or he's struggling? Well, probably because he is. Because he's handling this over here and trying to hold on to everything he's got in his own personal life and own personal struggles and own, his own sorrows. While all along, his other his people are, are going through some very difficult times and he does not want his burdens to ever get in the way of theirs. And so it can be sorrowful. The ministry life can be extremely frustrating. Because you work with people, you love them, and, and, and doesn't it sometimes seem like you care about their future success than they care? And it can be frustrating because you want them to grow, and you want them to walk with God, and you want them to get, get past some of these hurdles that are going on in their life, and it just seems like that they take a step forward and ten steps backwards, and, and you just want to pull your hair out, and you're more upset about the failures and about the lack of growth that they are. And so it can be frustrating. Sometimes it's frustrating because our churches don't grow as fast as we want them to. And we don't have what, well, let's be honest, we don't have the successes that we think that are necessary to classify our churches as success. And, and sometimes that has come because of the movement of fundamentalism that has declare that the only successful churches are the mega churches and and I would just go on record to tell you tonight that that is the most foolish thing that I've ever heard the backbone of our world today is not the mega churches it's the churches that are running 25 and 50 and 75 and 100 2 and 300 that are just sticking to the stuff and winning people to Christ and loving people right where they're at and so because you hear all of these things and the the humanistic de definition of success has weighed upon us. The ministry can become frustrating. And sometimes we feel as though that load will just never cease. And there's a great need to dealing with these problems, these difficulties, these frustrations, these unpredictable events that occur in our life. And David deals with with this for us tonight and he gives us the key not only to life but to us this evening to to ministry life do you realize that every week that you stand before your people and preach to them and teach to them you're giving them principles and truths that will, will not only help them but will help you and david says in that latter verse in verse 14 as he gives the key to us in, in our ministry lives, he says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And he shall strengthen thine heart. Look what he says. He says it again. Wait, I say, on the Lord. There's an example of this in Scripture. In the book of Matthew, if you will hold your spot in, in, in Psalms 27 and Turn over, if you will, to Matthew chapter number one. There's a recording of a man here that many people do not take notice of. To be honest with you, to most, he is extremely insignificant. He's put on the back burner because an event is occurring here that has been waited for for hundreds of years. And that is the coming of the Messiah. But the coming of the Messiah did not come 
without some good, godly people being used of God to bring about this miraculous event that was going to occur. A lot of people talk about Mary and she was a great woman. The Bible says she was. She was blessed above all women. Now she's not what the Catholic Church has made her to be. and We believe that this evening. But by, by, by Scripture's own testimony, she was a great woman. But she also had a great man. Because this man, Joseph, is a man that very easily could have gone in a totally different direction. But he gives us a great example of what we're looking at this evening. If you will look at verse 18 and how the Bible describes this man. He says, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, look what it says, being a just man. And not willing to make her a public example was mindful to put her away privately. And I don't have to preach to you the whole thing. But what's going on here? You've preached it to it yourself. You've learned it your whole life. Most of you, you, you see here that he has a right to put her away. He has a right to not marry her. He, he has a right because his only understanding would be that she was unfaithful to him. But he did not make a quick spontaneous decision he allowed God to work in his life and he did what the psalmist David ex ex expected us to do and that is he took a step back and he waited Amen. you'll notice if you will in verse number 20 what it says but while he thought on these things but while he thought on these things he find the day that Joseph went aside and he began to think about the, the quandary that he was in. The difficult situation that he found himself. He found himself with an unpredictable circumstance. A difficult thing. Was he going to stand with Mary? Was he going to be the man that he ought to be and, and love her anyway? We know that he loved her because of the decisions that he's made and the willingness to go against the, the, the mainstream and to be willing to take the criticism that was going to come because of the decision that he was going to make. But you notice there that the Bible says that he waited. He thought on the situation that he was in. I personally am not a very patient person by nature. Maybe you're not that way and you're a better person than I am, but by nature I am pretty impatient and I struggle with that. Uh, now, back home our driving is not what it is here. I, I, this is nuts around here, all right? But, and Brother Quinlan is the craziest driver I have ever seen in my entire life. How we don't get in more accidents, I don't know. And anyway, I just my prayer life is ten times better being here than it has been. I'll guarantee you that. But back home, I'm pretty impatient. I don't like people. We have what we call the fast lane and the slow lane. The fast lane. Now listen, you don't have to have a driver's license to know this. The fast lane is for who? Fast drivers. Correct. And this guy right here is going to graduate. I guarantee you that. Fast drivers. The slow lane is for who? Slow drivers. Man, you got to catch it on. It's easy to drive in America. Get out of the fast lane and let us go because we've got places to go. And now we don't honk like you guys do. We probably get run over or shot or something there. But nonetheless, uh, I'm not a very patient person. I don't like to wait on things. Um, I'm an impulse buyer. Anybody know what an impulse buyer is? When I feel like I've got to have something, I don't wait for Christmas. I have Christmas all the time. <laughs> and my kids, I've got older kids now, and they'll, they'll say, Dad, what do you want for Christmas? And I'll say, well, you can go to my Amazon account, and you look there what I've got on my, on my saved stuff. But by Christmas time, it's all gone because I've already bought it for myself. And so they're always mad at me because I'm impatient. It is when I am impatient, though, that it gets me in the most trouble. 
especially when it comes to dealing with the ministry life and handling the church that God has given to me and the people that I'm responsible for. But I'm not careful. I can blow right past them and hurt them in a very hurtful manner and it caused great problems. You know, Joseph waited. He waited thoughtfully. He waited knowingly. He by faith trusted God that what was about to occur was exactly what the angel said. That salvation was coming. The conception was going to be miraculous. And the whole purpose was so that Jesus could come and be the Savior to his people. You and I tonight need to take a step back this evening. And we need to consider some things about the ministry life and learn to wait. When I sign Bibles, I have sometimes kids will come up and they'll want to sign Bibles. I always sign my, my name, Pastor Jared Shipman. And then I always put this verse, Psalms 46.10. I don't know that I've got a life verse, so to speak. If I had a life verse, as they call it, this would be it. There's many verses that God has given me through the years for particular uh, moments and, and conflicts or struggles that have guided me through, as I'm sure you as well. But this one has always been constant for me. It says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. I've had to learn to look, I have had to learn to step back and be still. In other words, be patient. Wait on the Lord. Wait, I say, on the Lord. In verse 13 of Psalms 27, we find here the key to waiting. Waiting is hard. Waiting is difficult. It's a struggle. Uh, every man in the Bible dealt with this. Abraham got ahead of God. And you and I are reaping the consequences of Abraham getting ahead of God. Ishmael and Isaac. We have today the Jews and all the others that are over there fighting and fussing. And all of that did not begin yesterday. It began back when Abraham decided not to wait upon the Lord and wait for the promised seed. And he and his wife got ahead of God. And how many times do we do that in our own lives and it causes a great problem? But the key to waiting is found in verse 13. He said this, now you ought to underline these three words. I had fainted. He's not saying that he's going to faint or he did faint. He's saying it in this manner. I would have. I would have, I would have been a statistic. I would have been out of the ministry. I would have been out of the work of God. I would have, I would have fallen by the wayside. Look what he says. Unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You know, when you're right in the middle of some struggles and trials, it's hard to see the goodness in them. It's, it's hard to push away the fog that is there so that you can see what God is trying to do. And, and sometimes we just cry out to God and say, God, I don't understand what's going on, but I just trust you. But it is good when we can step aside and see the goodness of the Lord. And that's what David does many times, and he does that here. And for a little while tonight, I'd like to talk to you about that subject. Stepping aside and believing to see the goodness of the Lord. God is good. God is good all the time. All the time, God is good. God is good and God is right. God is good both day and night. God is good, so never fear. He's always right and always near. God is good. We can say that over and over again tonight, and it ought to cause conviction in our heart, because the reason that we get impatient and because of the reason that we fall into the load of unpredictable, difficult circumstances is we fail to see the goodness of the Lord. God is good all the time. God's been good to you today. Even though you've almost been swept away by a tsunami. 
God's been good. You've come with your umbrellas and you still have a smile on your face. You know why? Because God is good. Yeah. It could be a lot worse. It could be a lot worse. But God is good. I want you to notice a few things that David reminds us of here that we must believe in. He says, first of all, if you're going to see the goodness of the Lord and you're going to believe in it, you're going to have to believe in the power of the Lord. Our God is powerful. Amen. Look at verse number one. He said, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? He said, I have nothing to fear. I have nothing to be afraid of. Why? Because God is my salvation. Hey, aren't you glad you're saved tonight? Okay, I'm not sure all of you are saved. So, are you glad that you're saved tonight? I mean, you could be on your way to hell. You could be on your way to hell. You could be out in this world, not have ever experienced the truths and the blessings of God. You ought to realize tonight that because you're saved, you have nothing to fear. God has us in His hand, and no man can pluck us out of His hand. I am secure. I can't lose my salvation. Once I was saved, I was always saved. I can't get out if I wanted to. You're going to heaven whether you like it or not. I tell our people that all the time because some of them act like that they're going to have to be drug into heaven. They have no joy. And do you know that how that you enjoy serving God here will probably be indicative of how that you enjoy heaven? If you're not looking forward to heaven now, what is going to, why would it be enjoyable when you get there? I, I don't know if this is true or not. I don't have any Bible on it, so don't go out of here uh, saying I'm preaching heresy, but I'm not. It's just, this is my opinion. I think people that enjoy serving God and looking for heaven now, I think they'll enjoy heaven more. Amen. I just do. I think you're going to get there, and you're going to be far, far more ahead of everyone else that's been sucking on a dill pickle and sour-faced all the time and everything robbing their joy. God is good. His power has saved us. Okay, I don't think you're understanding tonight. You are a saved person. That alone ought to cause you to rejoice in the Lord and to wait upon Him. Notice what it says in verse 5. Because of my salvation, the effects of the power of God upon my life. Look at verse 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. Look what it says. You get, you get something even more special than all the other people that are saved. You've been called to the ministry, and you get to do exactly what David is talking about. Look what he says. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Amen. You know what you get to do every day? You get to get up and go to the house of the Lord. That's your work. I mean, I realize some of you may work other jobs, but you have a, you have a job of going to church all the time. That doesn't excite you. I love every morning I get to get up, I get in my car, I drive the 10 or 15 minutes to my, to my church building, I walk inside, I open the doors of the secretary hasn't already opened them, I go to my office, and I get to be all day in the house of the Lord. Does that not excite you? Because if it doesn't, you probably need to find something else to do. Because it is what's going to keep you going. It's going to keep you going during some very difficult times knowing that you get to go to the house of God. Now look what else he says. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. 
In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Not only does he cause me to desire the house of the Lord, but he causes me when I believe in the power of God to want to praise him. I like the way you sing. Our church sings. We love to sing. Sometimes on Sunday nights and Wednesday nights, we will sing for an hour before we even get to the preaching time. And people will say, I want to sing this song. And we'll sing that song. And we have a good time praising the Lord. And you ought to. You know why? Because God is good. God is good. God is good no matter what circumstances you're facing tonight. You've got to believe in the goodness of God. You've got to believe in His power. Secondly, you must believe in the presence of the Lord. You've got to believe in the presence of the Lord. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. He is always there. The psalmist David speaks of that here. In verse 7, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou sayest, seek me, seek ye my face. My heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Amen. He said when everybody else, and he uses a very important relationship, a mom and a dad. You know, when people lose a mom and a dad, that's a serious thing. And it, it's a, it leaves a great void in our lives. I think we could talk about it even a little bit differently as ministry. When people leave us, some of those that are closest to us, those ones that we trust, we serve along. And we have experienced some good times and we've experienced some hardships together. And then all of a sudden, they get sideways with God. And that person that was your confidant, your friend, and your close servant of the Lord with you has gone away. They have fallen by the wayside. When all of them go, the Lord will lift you up. The Lord is always there. He never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He never leaves you alone. The Bible said when David was one, at one of his lowest points, it says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. Hey, no matter what you're going through tonight, you're not alone. You're not alone. You may feel like that. You may feel like that when you get up to the pulpit on Sunday morning this coming week. You think you're all by yourself, but you're not. The Lord is there. He loves you. All you've got to do is wait upon Him. See His goodness. Let Him work in your life. Believe in the power of the Lord. Believe in the presence of the Lord. And then David says, believe in the protection of the Lord. Look at verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path. Because of mine enemies, deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies. For false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. How many of us relate to those verses sometimes? People breathing out cruelty. People making false statements. We love people so dearly. We want them to succeed in their walk with the Lord. And yet it seems like they turn against the very ones that love them the most. Jesus himself said a prophet is without honor save in his own country. Sometimes to the closest people, we, have, we are without honor and without love. Uh, Paul, Paul said, he said, the reason that I'm still here is because my love for you constrains me here. He said, I stay here because I love you. No, and then he says this, in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, I will love you the more even though you may love me less. Hey, the less that people love us, the more we should want to love them. Because the reality is that they need us. Your church needs you. Your church needs you to be a prayer warrior. Your church needs you to be a pillar of truth and stand. They need you to stand behind the pulpit and preach the infallible, the inerrant, perfect word of God without any apology. Amen. 
to them or to anyone else. They need you to wait on the Lord. Learn the way of the Lord, he says. He said, lead me in a plain path. <laughs> Don't take me down the complicated path. Take me down the simple path. You know whose path is complicated? Mine. My path is always complicated. You know what Jesus said? Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, you let me take care of things, I can resolve your problems and you won't feel the way that you feel and you won't be, be crushed under the load that you're placing upon yourself. We must follow the path of the Lord. One of my favorite verses is Isaiah 40, 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I love that verse and God gave, obviously, I mean, probably I've heard that my whole life, but have you ever had times in your life where a particular verse just meant something more special than it ever had? And it's just like that God took a highlighter and highlighted and said, hey, here's what you're gonna need right now. About five years ago, does this thing come off here? Is it, is this not working? Okay, let me just use this. About five years ago, my wife and I went through an extremely difficult time in the ministry. And, uh, and I'm not telling you this tonight because I want you to feel sorry for me at all because the things I learned through it have changed my life. And it has really given me a softer look at life in general because uh, you know when I was young I grew up in a very rigid strict home my dad was a disciplinarian and he raised us boys right and he didn't let us uh, get away with anything and uh, we were he was he was former military and so uh, I can tell you stories after stories and I don't want to bore you with that uh, but I'm thankful for the upbringing that I have but because of that because we were all boys and my dad was a man we were all tough. Uh, my brothers and I, we didn't resolve anything by talking. We resolved everything by punching each other until one of us submitted to the other. And uh, because I was the oldest and the biggest, I usually won unless all three of them got on me and then we were, we were in a big struggle. And so over the years, I developed a calloused, uh, rigid, tough exterior. And when I began to pastor, that exterior came out. And I was hard on people and I was demanding of them in a lot of ways that I probably shouldn't have been demanding. And I should have been more patient and long suffering and loving toward them. And, and I had to learn some lessons. And so about five years ago, my wife and I, uh, we really went through an issue. Our, our older son, we have four children and we have a 26 year old, a 22 year old and a seven year old and a almost two years old. So we got two different families and, and uh, same wife, okay, same husband, just two different families and uh, it, it's been a joy. We were almost got rid of the first two and then these other two popped up and so we just started all over again. But um, uh, Eli, our youngest son, was about two years old and our daughter got married and she had moved off and and our older son was about, he was 17, about ready to graduate high school. And boy, he really went through a tough time and was trying to figure some things out spiritually. And he had gotten sideways with some, some things at school and some friends had begun to convince him of things about his parents and about church and about those things. And I think a lot of kids are faced with, but preacher's kids, uh, many times have greater pressures on them because of the expectations that are that are there and and if I could say anything to you tonight as a, as a parent of, of your children preachers be careful not to expect more out of them than they're able to handle because they are still children and they are still trying to figure things out like all the other church kids are given a lot of grace whereas sometimes our kids we really lower the boom on them and sometimes it's because we don't want to be embarrassed and we don't want them to struggle but nonetheless nicholas really went through a hard time ultimately i had to uh, give him an ultimatum he had to move out or he had to follow the rules and he chose to leave our home and, and it was a 
very difficult time. Because I love my kids. I, we, my wife and I are very involved with them. I have been very careful about letting my ministry take up their time. Uh, and being careful about putting church people aside at times so that I can give them 100% of my focus. And I would challenge you again, be sure to do that. Don't let the church uh, usurp more than it should because our kids are extremely important. Our marriages are important. And we need them. And, and so him going through that really set my wife and I back and we began to struggle with that. Well, about that time, I... My daughter uh, was uh, getting ready to have a, a baby, and, and uh, we found that the baby was having some struggles. And anyway, we went up to North Dakota where they were at, and, and uh, the, she went into labor. Labor was extremely long. During that time, the baby had, our grandson had a stroke and uh, caused some very uh, extensive brain injuries to him, and, and ultimately finding out that he had a, a very rare aneurysm and so they life flighted him on a, on a helicopter down into Denver to a very special hospital to, to deal with it. And so we packed our kids up and our, at that time we only had uh, Eli and, and then Bianca and Jake, our, our son-in-law. And, and they we packed him up and drove all night to try to get there about the time that Leland did. And the next few days were extremely unpredictable. We didn't know what was going to occur. They told us he would die within a few hours. And so us getting there just to be able to spend some time with him was extremely important. We went in and he had wires coming out of his head and big bandages. And they were doing everything they could to try to just keep him alive. And uh, we began to, you know, really call out to the Lord and ask God to help us because our son Nick was going through a very difficult time. We're on the verge of losing him. We had some things going on with the family of, the, of our church that some very close people that when we first went to our church, we discipled them and, and they got into church because of our influence upon their life. And so God really knit us together and they had turned against us and the church and we're leaving. And, and so you have all of that you're dealing with and then you have your own son that you're, you're, you're carrying that load with him. And, and hoping that he's not going to make some very tragic decisions in his life. And now you have your grandson on the on the verge of, of, of dying. And then not only that, you have the, the mom and dad, our daughter and our son-in-law, looking to us and saying, what are we going to do? And I'm just here to tell you, you don't have answers for those things. And you've got to step back and say, God help me to wait upon you. And I remember one day in particular, our grandson was in the hospital for six months there in the, in the NICU, the, the intensive care for the kids. And, and so we stayed with our, our kids off and on. We would drive up to Denver and stay with them. And they lived in the hospital for six months with him. And, and uh, I remember some, uh, one day in particular, Steph and I were walking out of the room and they had told us, well, you know, we've done really about all we can do. Uh, he's probably got a few months maybe and and that's going to be it and because we had just come back from home we had been dealing with some issues there and our son and then some other family issues in the church and and I remember walking to the elevator and I remember I, and Steph maybe remember me saying this too where I said I'm really not sure how much more that I can take I said I think I'm to the end of my rope. And I was. And I realized for the first time in my life that I was not invincible. Yeah. Have you ever been there? Yeah. Where you think you've got it all figured out and you're this tough person that can handle anything. You're answering everybody else's problems and then all of a sudden you're in a situation that you have no answers to. And I said to her, I don't think I can do it anymore. I don't think I can lose my son. I don't think I can lose my grandson. We went down to the cafeteria. We were sitting there and we got a little bite to eat. And I was eating. And I was, she and I were kind of talking back and forth. And out of the corner of my eye, I caught this wheelchair moving. 
And I looked over there, and there's this little boy. He could have been more than eight or nine years old. Bald-headed. Very frail. It was obvious that he had been battling cancer for some time. And I said, you know, I really don't have this bad as I think I do. There's a lot of people having a lot worse than me. I mean, this little boy running his little wheelchair around. And you know what? He wasn't down in the mouth like I was. He wasn't having a pity party. He was ready, running around and talking to people and laughing and playing jokes on people. I'm like, that little boy has more understanding of life than I do. And the reality is, is I probably know more about who to go to than he does. And the Lord gave me this verse. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Our grandson celebrated his fifth, fifth birthday just a couple months ago. Well, actually, last month of July. And he is the sweetest little dude you've ever met in your entire life. He walks with a lamp on one side because his left side is never really developed because of the stroke and the aneurysm. But he loves his poppy. That's me. And God has used him to help me to learn to wait. Because the longer we've waited on the Lord, the better it's gotten. I'm not telling you it always turns out that way. We could lose him at any moment. In fact, here in a few weeks, in the first part of September, he'll have his ninth brain surgery. And every brain surgery is very uh, difficult and it's very problematic. He very well could die. But every moment we get with him, I'm reminded that God is good. God is good all the time. Our older son is, he's not everything I'd like him to be, but he's a lot better. He's at least trying to figure some things out spiritually and trying to put God first in some areas of his life. Our daughter's gone through some very difficult times with her husband. She just had a, uh, a little baby. The baby's like eight weeks old. Two weeks before she was about to have her baby, about about a month, I guess, her husband came to her and said he was leaving. Gave her divorce papers and walked out. I'm telling you, life is hard. Not just for the people we serve, but it's hard for us. And if we don't learn this truth tonight, I had failed. I would have failed, David said, unless I had seen the goodness of the Lord. Preacher, you can make it. You know why? Because God is good. Amen. Preacher's wife, you can make it. You know why? Because God is good. Amen. College student, you'll make it. I know it doesn't seem like it, but you will. You may be in your 10th year, but you'll make it. Amen? God can use us if we'll just wait upon Him. Heavenly Father, I pray tonight that you'll help us to wait upon you. There's no doubt in my mind that there's those here tonight that are so hurt. They've been offended or transgressed by people that they thought loved them and some very important co-workers of the ministry in their life. And God, it hurts when we lose people. It hurts when our families don't turn out right, when they struggle. It hurts when we see some of our people go through very difficult times. And sometimes, Father, we get to the end of our rope. We don't know what else to do. There may be some here like that tonight. And I pray this evening that they'll find comfort in knowing 
that if they'll just wait upon you, that you'll meet those needs. That you'll solve those problems. That you'll bind up those broken hearts. And you'll give them the strength they need to get up and to dust their feet off, dust their riches off, and to go at it again. God, help us tonight to wait upon you. In Jesus' name we pray.